Greetings and welcome back to the broadcast. Today is Friday, February 17th, 2017. And on Fridays right now, we are working through the book of Revelation. Kind of in a Bible study style format. And uh, I'm really personally enjoying it. And hey, you know, I know some of you wish that, I, that it would the podcast would be longer. Um, but I truly am doing the best I can with the time that I have and... You know, I'm hoping someday that I have an hour a day to de- dedicate to recording and and teaching and studying God's Word with you guys. Um, I, you know, but that's just not the current form. And plus, you know, I'm only taking one chapter at a time in most cases uh, as we're doing this study, and some chapters are longer than others. And I think it kind of helps narrow down each thing. And uh, so, hopefully, hopefully, you guys understand. Uh, why we're doing it the way we're doing it. Um, if you didn't get a chance to check uh, the Catch the Prophecy podcast, I did one yesterday. Um, it's up at the website, www.scriptureandprophecy.com, along with our study from the book of John this week. So this is the third podcast this week, so not too shabby. And uh, so hopefully it's blessing you guys and, and you're enjoying uh, the work of you know the work that I'm putting forth for you. Uh, today we're going to be going through chapter 7 in the book of Revelation. You know, we did chapter 6 last week, uh, dealing with the four horsemen, and we wrapped up, when you wrapped up, we wrapped up chapter 6, the very last verse tells us for sure that God's wrath has already come, uh, so I don't think that the, that an argument can be made that we're still waiting for God's wrath to start, and or that it's halfway through that, you know, I, I'm not buying that, because right here, it says, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who is able to stand? That's the last verse in chapter 6. So, the wrath of God starts with the seals, just as the scriptures show us right here. Um, that is my point of view. Um, also, I've, I've spoken with you guys about the, the rapture, and that I do hold a pre-tribulation rapture. Um, some people say, no, it's pre-wrath, and I say, there's no difference between pre-wrath and pre-tribulation. Uh, again, I have to specify, because people will be coming to the comments and people will be arguing amongst each other. I'm not dogmatic about these things. I do not believe the rapture is a salvation issue that we have to uh, completely agree on. I believe it is a mystery, just like Paul claims it is. Uh, but from the scriptures, I believe point to a pre-tribulation rapture. But it's not one of those things that I'm willing to go to war with people over. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, at the end of this study. So, without further delay, let's go ahead and get started. And uh, we'll read through it, and I'll stop and make points uh, as I see needed. Revelation chapter 7, verse 1. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Now, something I want to bring up real quick before we move forward. One thing we need to pay attention to is the context. So the, we have the four angels holding back the four winds, at, and you know, and then we see a, uh, another angel who has the seal of God, and he says, "Don't hurt anything yet. Don't hurt the earth or the sea. Wait until we've sealed the servants of God on the foreheads." And so we, that poses a question: Who are these servants of God that it's talking about, and it's getting ready to tell us very specifically who they are? I mean, very, very specifically. And uh, I'll address the seal in the forehead here in just a second, but I just wanted to make that point before I go further because some people, uh, well, let's just move forward. 
So he, he says, Do not hurt the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And then the next four verses are going to tell us exactly who these servants of God are that will be sealed. Verse 4. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of God were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Aser were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Nephtalim were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Manassas were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Simon were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Ishkar were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Zebulon were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Joseph were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed twelve thousand. Very clearly it tells us who are the people who are God's servants that are, going to, that are going to have a seal put in their forehead? It is 144,000 Jews of Israel. And it tells us that there's 12,000 that come from each one of these specific tribes. So they're Jewish. And they come from these 12 tribes of Israel. It's very, very specific. And if we go to chapter 14, verse 1, you don't have to turn there right now. We'll get to it when we get to it. But if you go to chapter 14, verse 1, it addresses these 144,000 Jews again. And it gives even more detail. And it tells us that they're not only Jewish, but they're males and that they're virgins. And so these women on YouTube who put a scarf on their head and claim to be prophets and then they claim to be one of the 144,000, they don't know what they're talking about. They're not Jewish, they're not from any of these tribes of Israel, and they're not male. Sorry, I get a little fired up about that because I'm so sick of the false YouTube prophets out there. And when I say false YouTube prophets, I'm talking about the thus says the Lord people. And for years they've been spouting off and being wrong, and then yet still thousands of Christians follow after them. Back to my point. The angels are told not to hurt the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till the, till the servants of God have had a seal placed on their forehead. Now, later on in Revelation, we're going to get to the mark of the beast. You know, you have to take the mark either in your right hand or in your forehead. You see, when these 144,000 are sealed, and I think there will literally be a mark in their forehead, the enemy always copies God. He always counterfeits God. That's why when the mark of the beast is implemented, people will be taking it in their forehead. They are sealed in their forehead. You know, he copies, he counterfeits all that God does. It's not just about being microchipped, although that may be part of it. It's about who you belong to. Who do you worship? Who is your allegiance to? That's what the mark of the beast is really all about. The other things are just for, you know, for control and all of that. And of course, the chip and all that stuff that we see talked about makes a lot of sense. Um, but I think that seal, you know, and the mark of the beast, I think the mark of the beast is just a counterfeit of the seal because we're going to have 144,000 Jews preaching on this earth along with two witnesses. And we'll get to that uh, as we move along. Verse 9. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. And cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders, 
and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessings and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. Now, poses another question. John sees a number of people, a great multitude, unnumerable, it says. He says there were so many people, no man can even number it. And they were a mixture of all different nations, of kindreds, of different types of people, different tongues, meaning they all, in multiple languages. They all stood before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. So here we have an innumerable amount of Christians standing in the throne room. Now, who are these people? Um... My personal belief and what I've taught for years is I think this is the raptured saints right here. Here they are. They've come out of the great tribulation because they're not going to be part of it. And here they are standing before the throne worshiping God. And the reason why I think that mostly is because, number one, they're coming from all different tribes, tongues, language. Okay, so there was a group that's up there that's from different places all over the planet. There's so many of them they can't be numbered. There's so many of them, they can't be numbered. So that is the position that I hold. Um, But real quick, let's go ahead and read uh, the rest of this, and we'll talk about this some more. Verse 13, And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? So the elders asking John, Who are these people? Where did they come from? And then he's going to give us the answer. Verse 14, And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest, he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them into unto living fountains of waters. And God shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes. And that's the end of chapter 7. And aren't you longing and looking forward to a day when there will be no tears left in your eyes? And God is going to personally wipe them away. Now, there is commentary out there and a belief that these are what they call tribulation saints. These are people who've died in the tribulation, uh, who are Christians. I don't think that's what's going on here, but like I said, I'm not dogmatic about these things when it comes to prophecy because prophecy is best understood in hindsight. Prophecy is best understood in that we see it fulfilled and we go, there it is. That makes sense. God really is who he says he is. It's not necessarily for predicting the future. And uh, so that very well could be that these are tribulation saints. The reason why I think it's it's more likely the, you know all the people who have been raptured and resurrected is because there's just so many. But lots of people are going to die during the tribulation, right? Lots of people are going to die. Um, you know, the four beasts, they, they have power to kill with a sword and with hunger and with death. At a, a fourth part of the world. Fourth part of the earth, right? So, that's a lot of dead people. So, that is possible. Uh, but I just wanted to present what I believe it is and, you know, some of the other commonly held positions with this. That they're just, they're Christians who are just martyred and killed in, within the... Uh, the Great Tribulation itself, the Tribulation Saints, some people refer to them. I personally think when it says they've came out of Great Tribulation, that means they were taken out of it. They came out of it, not that they have went through it. Um, And we've only had the first six seals so far. Okay, now... The point of... uh, Just a few more points about the Rapture. Um, 
you know, there's a lot of reasons that I believe that it could be and most likely is pre-trib. Uh, but they're, most of them are not for the reasons that other people believe. You know, you do have the Church of Philadelphia. And I, I want to just kind of revisit that again. Um, because I think this is an example of some people who will be raptured. Um, he says, verse 10 in chapter 2. Because thou hast kept, or chapter 3, I'm sorry, verse 10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. And I believe that he's speaking about the tribulation. I think it's very, very clear. And I think the, the, the temptation that he's referring to, I believe the temptation is the lie. The lie, the lie, the great deception that we talk about that's coming upon the whole earth, that the whole earth, because remember, the whole earth is going to marvel and worship this beast. The whole earth, it says. And, you know, the deception is going to be so great, the lie is going to be so great that it'll deceive even the elect, if possible, the scriptures say. And so I think a big part of the reason for the rapture is to spare us from that temptation and I'm going to show you uh, something uh, else related to that here in just a minute. Luke tells us to pray, or actually it's Jesus telling us, it's in the book of Luke, to pray to be counted worthy to escape all of these things and to stand before the Son of Man. And what do we have happening here in chapter 7? All these people are standing before the Lamb. That's what it says. And... After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. They're standing before the Lamb. Jesus says, pray to be counted worthy. Actually, I, th I believe he says, pray without ceasing, or pray continually, to be counted worthy to escape all of these things that are coming upon the earth and to stand before the Son of Man just like what we see taking place here in chapter 7. So that's just kind of uh, my thoughts on that. I'm not going to go into a whole teaching or, and, or anything like that about the rapture. I will make one more point in regards to the rapture. We were just talking about how in the Church of Philadelphia, they're going to be spared the hour of temptation, which I just told you I believe is that hour of deception, uh, that's going to deceive, that's so going to be so great it could deceive even the elect. One of the arguments I hear from people who say there is no rapture, there is no pre trained rapture, is they say, well, that was invented in the 1800s by somebody named Darby, and it was, and he got it from some witch, and blah, 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 blah. That is just flat out not true. Um, there's several examples of early church fathers. We're talking early, early. We're talking disciples of the disciples' disciples. So we're talking real close there uh, who talked about uh, being spared the, the tribulation. Um, they didn't use the word rapture. They used the word gathered, which is what the scriptures say. We were going to be gathered, right? We caught up to join him in the air. Um there's a book out there that you can get on Amazon by Ken Johnson. It's called The End Times by the Ancient Church Fathers. And he has writings and quotes in this little book uh, from three different church fathers. We have, and I'm probably going to mispronounce their names, but we have Arrhenius, who was a pro uh, Protestant. We have Ephraim the Assyrian, who was Eastern Orthodox. And we have Hippolytus, Hippolytus who was a Roman Catholic. All three of these guys taught an outline of a gathering or a rapture before the tribulation, the gathering of the church before the tribulation. All three of these guys taught it. And just to give you an example of, it's got a graph in here so that you can even see this for yourself, but you have the Apostle John. He had two guys under him, Polycarp and Ignatius, and then Arrhenius was a disciple of Polycarp. That's how old these church fathers are. That's how far back they go. We're talking like 100 A.D., between 100 and 200 A.D. So the idea that the rapture was 
uh, was invented, made up in the 1800s by some witch and then picked up by some guy named Bar Darby. That's just not true. That's just not true at all. Uh, let me just give you one quote from Ephraim, the Assyrian. By the way, you can look this guy up online for yourself and read his quotes for yourself. Uh, in regards to the pre-tribulation rapture, he says this, For all the saints and the elect of God are gathered prior to the tribulation that is to come and are taken to the Lord, lest they see the confusion that will overwhelm the world because of our sins. See, he's even alluding to the whole confusion thing. The, I think that's what Jesus is getting at about the temptation. I'm going to keep you from the hour of temptation. You know, the, the deception will be so great that even the elect could be deceived. And so, dear brothers, I'm just going to finish reading his writing. It is the eleventh hour, and the end of the world comes to the harvest, and angels armed and prepared hold sickles in their hands, awaiting the empire of the Lord. And we think that the world is completely blind to this, arriving at its downfall early. Commotions are happening, wars of diverse people, battles, incursions, and barbarians threaten, and countries are being desolated. Isn't that just amazing? That even at in this time, 200 A.D.-ish, 300 A.D., he was seeing these similar things and thought for sure the end was near. Folks, the return of Christ has always been imminent, and we always need to be prepared. And of course, I think we have even more signs, obviously. Let me finish his last paragraph. We seem neither afraid when hearing the rumors of wars nor seeing them appear. We should repent. If we are afraid of them, it is because we do not wish to be changed. We need to repent of that too. And that's just a quote from him. It's a cool book. I, I'd recommend that you pick it up. Anyway, I just wanted to share that with you. Uh, last comments, and then I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, you know, I, I did that podcast yesterday. And I noticed some people in the comments talking about, you know, how it's just the spiritual warfare and how temptation to fall into sin is there. And there's just, you know, it's just a struggle right now. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm right there with you as far as, you know, the spiritual warfare. L I've got things that I'm dealing with uh, even right now that are just really weighing me down. You know, things in my personal life, attacks in my personal life. And the way the enemy likes to attack me is, is through my, you know, the people I love. And so I'm right there with you. And I honestly think that it's even harder for those who are actually waiting and watching for Christ and longing for his appearing. Because we, we don't love this world. We just want Jesus to come back. And so for us, it's even harder because we look at the filth. We look at what's going on. We, we're watching this country that we love just falling apart. The world falling apart. Evil being embraced and good being persecuted. We're seeing all of this. And because we don't love the world and we're longing for Jesus, it's even harder for us because we just want to go home. And so I just want to say I understand what you're saying. And you know, for the worldly Christians, they're not feeling that way because they love the world. So for them, everything's good. You know, they love they love to go to the movie theater and, and fill their brains with poison. They love to sit in front of their TV and fill their minds with poison. You know, they just they love they just love the wickedness. They love this world, they're not longing for Jesus, and they're gonna miss out on a crown of righteousness that's promised to those who love his appearing. I want to point out one thing. Um, but it's going to take me a second to find it. Dealing with the Philadelphia Church. Let's just read the Philadelphia Church and then I'll find it that way. And then we'll wrap it up. It starts with verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David. He that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. Here's the part I wanted to point out. For thou hast little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Jesus is acknowledging that these particular people, they have little strength. They don't have much left, do they? 
He's acknowledging that. For thou hast little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. And then if you go down to verse 10, because thou hast kept my word, or kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him, him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. My friends, that is the podcast for this morning. I hope that it was enlightening, and I also hope that it was encouraging and a blessing to you. And, uh, you know, unfortunately very small percentage of you actually listen to this version of the podcast very few of you actually go through these bible studies and i think that's a great tragedy because while they can listen to the prophecy podcast that's good and great this is where the meat's happening this is where the meat is and so uh those few of you who who actually enjoy this um i pray that you're being blessed by it Hey, if you want to support me in the mission of truth, you can do that. Scriptureandprophecy.com is the website and uh, where that can be done. It's also the archives for blogs. I write blogs once a week um, and even do devotionals uh, many times on Saturday mornings. Uh, so make sure you're checking that out. You can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and uh, I think that about covers it. That's all I got. i got to get ready for work. Peace and grace be with all of you. God bless.